मेरी स्पीकर का वेलकम फ्लावर प्रोग्राम डायरेक्टर डॉक्टर अर्चना भदौरिया का स्वागत है जो स्टूडेंट्स पीछे बैठे हैं आगे आ जाएं, आगे सीटें खा लें सब लोग आगे आ जाइए जल्दी से उठिए आगे आ जाइए आगे आगे सीट्स पे आइए सब लोग नीचे अंधेरे में जो लोग बैठे हैं वो भी आगे हैं। अंधेरे में लोग जो लोग बैठे हैं अभी हम वहाँ पे बड़ी वाली लाइट जलवाने वाले हैं सबका फेस दिखेगा क्या कर रहे हैं आप नीचे आगे आइए इंट्रोड्यूस करें जल्दी से आइए आगे आइए सब लोग आगे आइए पीछे अभी भी लोग बैठे हुए नहीं सुन रहे हैं जो लोग बाहर हैं कॉफी पी रहे हैं कॉफी पी चुके इनवाइटिंग अस टू गिव दिस लेक्चर एंड इट्स अ ग्रेट प्लेजर टू इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर अनीता सक्सेना वी ऑल हैव हर्ड अस सो फ्रीक्वेंटली एंड वी ऑल आर वी एज इन डॉक्टर फ्रेटर्निटी वी आर ऑलवेज ईगर टू लिसन टू हर द क्वालिटी ऑफ आवर लेक्चर्स आर दैट दे आर वेरी सिंपल एंड इंटरेस्टिंग and they keep us well bound uh dr anita is md and phd from cambridge uh, england and uh, she also has post doctoral fellowship from uh, cambridge university and she is additional professor in nephrology uh, sanjay gandhi post graduate institute of medical sciences and uh, her area of interest is malnutrition and ckd end stage renal disease dialysis post transplant blood volume monitoring in dialysis patients and she has 28 years of work experience and uh, her achievements are that one of the major achievements is that she has uh, she has a key role in establishing society of renal nutrition and metabolism in 2014 and this society is an official chapter of international society of renal nutrition and metabolism and she is also editor of uh, official journal of society of renal nutrition and metabolism and she is also an associate editor in clinical queries of elsevier publication and she has many national and international journals to her credit and one of the great achievements and a uh, and major honor and award uh, um, uh, of dr anita saxena is that she is an expert for review panel for kidney disease outcome quality uh, initiative that is kdoki and this is a true recognition in her field of work in renal nutrition and she is a member of many advisory boards uh, concerning renal nutrition uh, she has been awarded with young scientist award in uh, 2006 in india many uh, poster award presentations many best paper award uh, for her, in her credit to her credit and many podium presentations at national and international levels and she has been invited uh, as a faculty to give lectures in various uh, prestigious uh, societies and with this uh, i welcome dr anita Uh, and we all are waiting to hear from you uh, and this is a topic uh, concerning nutrition in cancer which is similar to nutrition in uh, end stage renal patient uh, same principles are guiding nutrition in cancer patients also and uh, now i give uh, the mic to dr jayesh kushma who will be chairing the session he is professor of medicine in uh, lakshmikant padmavat sigania institute of medicine um, nlr hospital and he would be introducing the subject of nutrition in cancer cancer is coming up in the society very well where and it, it is one of the serious condition so ma'am is going to talk about the nutrition in patients of cancer i request ma'am to please i'm going to speak on nutrition in cancer uh, but how a 
is nutrition involved in cancer? Well, historically, if you have a look, the association of diet with human cancer is attributed to consumption of food containing chemical carcinogens. The belief, this belief arose from observations that chimney soup was associated with testicular cancer of young chimney sweet boys. Um, in fact, I have written every word, almost every word that I'm going to speak, so you can have a look at the um, the, at the slides in case you don't understand my, what I'm saying. Um, and also, uh, the coal tar dyes that were present in chimney soup when applied to the skin of experimental rabbits caused skin cancer. Now, dietary fat, the epidemiological studies have shown, is associated with breast and colon cancer, and tobacco is the leading cause of cancer in India, oral cavity, cancer, pharynx, ossificus, larynx, lungs, and urinary bladder. All carcinogens are dependent on activation uh, by the cytochrome P450 system, which itself is profoundly influenced by nutrition, especially by dietary animal-based protein. Now, this paper is showing you that uh, ca uh, carcinogenic substances are present in the food. Traditional methods of, uh, of uh, preserving fish and meat by salting increase the incidence of cancer of mouth and pharynx. Preserving fish or meat by smoking procedures also is carcinogenic. Heating oil at a high temperature produces carcinogenic chemicals. And uh, frying or grilling of meat also produces uh, carcinogens. <coughs> Now, cooking methods can also have a postprandial impact on oxidative met metabolism. Protein and fat-rich food cooked quickly under high temperature leads to formation of um, advanced glycation uh, end products, that is AGs. Now, aflatoxins are naturally occurring carcinogens produced by a common fungus called asparagus, uh, asparagus, asparagus uh, flavors and asparagus parasiticus. Um, which thrives best at a temperature between 24 to 35 degrees in moist conditions. And it, it develops because of the bad storage practice, arsenic in drinking water are also carcinogens, and Chinese-style uh, salted fish are all carcinogenic. Now this study here is showing you the occurrence of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in milk and meat, fish-based uh, baked foods, which are available in Italy. And, uh, the occurrence of uh, 14 polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons has been shown in milk and meat-based high weight uh, foods. Here you can see um, this bar chart is showing you that if the fat content is high, these uh, uh, carcinogenic uh, food elements are higher, and if the fat content is low, then the carcinogenic food elements are low. So steaming methods are appropriate for cooking compared to roasting or smoking or grilling as low levels of hydrocarbons are produced. Now, pH formed during, uh, are also formed during incomplete burning of coal, oil, gas, uh, garbage, wood, and tobacco. And the dietary sources of uh, this pH are barbecued foods, cheeses, that, that is, the foods which are subjected to thermal treatment as drying, smoking, and roasting. Now, this is a map that is showing you the worldwide incidence, and it was estimated that by, 12, 000, uh, by 12, 2012, there would be about 14 million new cancer patients in the world. And this is a worldwide cancer incidence of the most common cancers like the lungs, the breast, stomach, prostate, and colon. Now, we're talking about cancer. What exactly is cancer? A cancer is a term of diseases for diseases in which abnormal cells divide without control and can invade nearby tissue. Cancer cells can also spread to other parts of the body through the blood and lymph system in, in human beings. Now, induction of neoplasm is a multi-event process occurring over time, which is divided into three phases. The first one is the chemical initiation. The second one is promotion of the later stage, um, in which the pre-neoplastic conditions are evolved, and the third is progression to form a clinically aberrant invasive cancer. Now, dietary constituents like chemicals, nutrients, and xenobiotics promote or promote or inhibit any of these carcinogenic steps, this does modulating tumor genesis. Now, what is cancer cachexia? Cancer cachexia is a multifactorial syndrome characterized by ongoing loss of skeletal muscle mass with or without fat loss, anorexia, weakness, fatigue that cannot be fully reversed by conventional nutritional support and leads to progressive functional impairment. Now, associated uh, it is associated with poor tolerance of anti-tumor treatments, reduced quality of life, and negative impact on survival. And cancer cachexia is present in about 50 to 80 percent of patients with malignancies. Now, it is associated with weight loss and malnutrition, which are common in all the cancer patients 
and they lead to poor quality of life, susceptibility to infection, socioeconomic problems, and reduced survival. Here you can see this is a patient who has undergone say, uh, uh, surgery for C. erectum, and you can see how placaxic he is. He's just got skin and bones and no fat, no subcutaneous fat, and no muscles. So this guy uh, right now is having uh, some kind of an infection, but he, he's a person who's not able to eat, and because of cancer, he's really uh, totally depleted. The body stores are depleted, and he is the one who really requires a lot of nutrition. So, and if you have a look at his nails, you can see that his the nails are pale, which means he's anemic and he's hyperalbuminemic. Now, the, here is another patient. Uh, you can see, uh, you can see the shoulder of the patient. See the clavicle. See this depression, which has lost all the fat and subcutaneous mass, and the prominent bony mass, uh, bony uh, landmarks are visible. And here you can see the spine. The vertebral column is so very clear. And so these are the kind of patients who really require uh, nutritional support. And here again is the same gentleman, he's got, you can see the landmarks, how cancer eats away the body. And if he's not eating well, then he's like this, okay? So uh, cancer growth is associated with system in, uh, inflammatory response, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which induces insulin resistance, protein hypercatabolism, and lipolysis, leading to loss of uh, muscle protein and body mass. These conditions may cause various uh, cancer-related symptoms, such as generalized fatigue, pain, nausea, anorexia, with, uh, which result in poor nutrition status. <coughs> Now, uh, cancer cachexia is characterized by negative protein and energy balance driven by a variable combination of reduced food intake and abnormal metabolism. So the kind of metabolism you see in cancer patients is protein metabolism is abnormal. It uh, leads to increased muscle protein catabolism, increased whole body protein turnover, increased liver protein synthesis, decreased uh, muscle protein synthesis, and the carbohydrate metabolism um, shows in, and comes up in the form of increased gluconeogenesis from amino acids and lactate, increased glucose, uh, glucose disappearance and recycling, insulin resistance, and the lipid metabolism is seen in the form of increased lipolysis, increased glycerol turnover, decreased lipo lipogenesis, decreased lipoprotein lipase activity, and fatty acid hyperlipidemia. Now, what is the mechanism of cancer cachexia? You will see it in three forms. You can see that cancer causes anorexia. Cancer causes anorexia, and along with that, there's reduced physical activity, psychological disorders, mechanical obstacles, which lead to reduce intake and absorptive disorders, exudative uh, enteropathies, all lead to cachexia. Now, when the cancer treatment is going on, this also leads to anorexia and so on, and also, uh, with, when the patient has a cancer, there's a competition between the host and the tumor cells. Therefore, there's inadequate energy intake versus energy expenditure. The metabolism of carbohydrate, lipid, and protein is deranged. So, and this all causes metabolic disturbances leading to cachexia. So there is, what is the treatment of cancer cachexia? So far, there is no single treatment plan for cancer cachexia because it is multifactorial characteristic syndrome. Therefore, the three areas that are key to, uh, uh, key to treating cancer cachexia are appropriate anti-tumor treatment, prevention, and supportive pharmacological intervention. So let's have a look at the appropriate anti-tumor treatment. It's just a uh, you know, simple thing to, uh, maybe you've already gone through it be uh, before in the earlier sessions. The term angiogenesis was invented by Scottish surgeon Dr. John Hunter, who discovered that new blood vessel formation was a crucial step in tissue expansion. Now, oncogenic progression in solid tumor relies on, relies on sprouting new uh, blood vessels from existing vessels, namely tumor angiogenesis, to supply oxygen, nutrients, and remove metabolic waste. Tumor angiogenesis is important for delivering oxygen and nutrients to growing tumor, and therefore, considered an essential pathological feature of cancer. Now, in order to prevent cancer from spreading, you have to do the reverse for the whole thing. So anti-angiogenesis therapy, it, what it requires is blocking formation of new blood vessels in tumor, turn, in tumor, which turns the tumor into a dormant disease. Now, this anti-angiogenesis hypothesis has motivated studies on developing agents for solid tumor fibroblast growth factors and vascular endothelial growth factors. Now, uh, this is something that I'm going to talk about starving cancer cells. So you starve cancer cells uh, through hypoxia by cutting off their oxygen and through uh, cutting off the nutrient supply that is 
uh, cutting off glucose. So if you have a look at this, uh, this picture, you can see that uh, this is a microenvironment of a solid tumor where the, you can see the super blood vessel, this is the oxygenated part of the tissue, and here is the uh, hypoxia which is created and, the, and this part is actually the black one is necrosed. So in, uh, this whole thing leads to inactivation of cell division in hypoxic uh, areas and the growth is arrested. So there are several anti-angiogenic uh, agents which have been developed, but I won't be talking about them. Now, uh, this is a paper on a new take on ceramide starving cells by cutting off nutrient supply. So far we were talking about hypoxia, now we're going to talk about cutting off nutri nutrient supply. So ceramide is a tumor suppressor lipid, which is bioactive lipid generated in response to DNA damage, cytokines, and low factor withdrawal. So what ceramide does is it blocks cell proliferation and stimulates cell differentiation and, and triggers cell uh, death. So here the nutrient transport is blocked, starvation starts. If it is mild, it leads to growth arrest and senescence, and, but if it is sub, uh, severe, then it apoptosis and necrosis ensues. So turmeric, which we normally eat in our foods, is called haldi in Hindi. Turmeric has an anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, and antioxidant properties. Uh, and so this property is used uh, because of, is there because of the compound called curcumin. And this is what is used for uh, treating cancers so now. So now moving on to nutrition intervention. Um, nutrition intervention includes appropriate nutrition screening, assessment, counseling, which should begin early in the course of disease to reduce negative effects on therapy and quality of life. Nutrition impact symptoms should be appropriately treated to minimize the role of GI uh, dysfunction, including adequate oral intake. Now, when a patient is having cancer, he feels like vomiting, he has nausea, he has pain. So the first step is to use antiemetic or prokinetic therapy, which should be maximized for treatment of nausea, vomiting, or delayed gastric emptying. Treat pain and symptoms of de depression. He loses appetite, so use appetite stimulants. Hydration is very, very important in these patients. You must keep your patients hydrated well. And liquid nutrition supplements are useful in increasing calorie intake. Now, um, there is yet another uh, thing that has come up. It's selectively starving cancers through dietary manipulation methods and clinical implications. So what happens in this is they're using metabolic-based, uh, metabolism-based therapies for standard care treatment uh, that is using dietary manipulation as a possible treatment for intervention of cancer. So there are three kinds of diets. One is carbohydrate restriction, that is ketogenic diet. The second one is calorie restriction, uh, restriction diet. The third one is intermittent fasting. So in ketogenic diet, what happens is you don't have to uh, restrict calories, but it is a very, very high fat diet, and along with that you can give high protein also. And uh, it does not result in cachexia or, or muscle weight while calorie restriction, it, it does uh, cause loss of weight and the intermittent fasting is, is not really tolerable by everyone. So I think the best diet for these patients is the keto diet, which is going to be beneficial for them. Now, if you have a look at this figure, this is showing you molecular pathways that are altered by disease, by, by decreased nutrient signaling in ketogenic diet, calorie restriction and intermittent fasting. So if you have a look at picture one, it is showing you that normal cells adapt to, to decrease nutrient supply and switch into maintenance state, but a cancer cell is not able to in this kind of a stress. A normal cell responds by decreasing AKT and RAS signaling in order to shift to an autophagy, but a cancer cell cannot do this. So cancer cells are unable to adapt, resulting in a differential stress response. Malignant cells are affected differently, and autophagy in these cells leads to increased apoptosis. And finally, when carbohydrate is restricted, the calories are restricted, the caspase 3 gets activated, and the DNA fragmentation takes place, and finally it leads to apoptosis. So calorie restriction exerts anti-cancer effects in many clinical models, and calorie restriction is also being used in cancer patients as a sensitizing strategy prior to chemotherapy regimens. Now, this is a mouse model, which is showing you that if you have a look at the bar charts, the, the white ones are the calorie-restricted mouse bars. And this, this is showing you when you restrict calorie, the, the mouse loses body weight, loses fat and mass. And the advantage of calorie restriction is that the colonization, the colony formation is really reduced here. And, and there's a very good response to the insulin, the fasting glucose, the IGF-1, the insulin levels, the lean body mass, and the 
prolactins. Now to achieve the state of nutrition ketosis, keto diet is usually composed of very low carbohydrate but very high fat content of uh, no, very high content of fat and may additionally be combined with calorie restriction. Um, advantage of keto diet is that keto bodies confer protection to normal cells during radio or chemotherapy, but the, the biggest advantage is that they are non-protective or even toxic to tumor cells. So you can have your, uh, you can you can actually program tumor death through them. High fat diet with ample protein intake is suited to meet metabolic demands of cancer patients. Now, catabolic alterations in cancer patients um, are four kinds: the inadequate nutritional intake, systemic inflammation syndrome, lack of physical exercise, and depression. Now, inadequate nutritional intake is associated with loss of weight, and the causes of loss of weight and inadequate nutritional intake are um, could be malignancy, which can cause obstructive obstruction, perforation of GI tract, intestinal and secretory abnormalities, malabsorption, intestinal dysmotility, fluid electrolyte abnormalities, and chemotherapy can also lead to inadequate nutritional intake because of anorexia. It can it can it can trigger anorexia altered taste, food aversions, nausea, vomiting, mucositis, enteritis, malabsorption, diarrhea, and IBS. Surgery is a very important part of, us, of cancer treatment. Therefore, even surgery can induce inadequate intake of food uh, in the form because it can induce malabsorption, diarrhea, addition, um, additions uh, induced due to obstruction or fluid electrolyte abnormalities, vitamin mineral abnormalities, because this will depend on which part of the GI tract has been resected. And radiation can also lead to anorexia, altered taste, mucositis, enteritis, xerostomia, obstruction, perforation, and stricture. And uncontrolled pain and side effects of drugs are also a cause of anorexia in these patients. Now, if you have a look at this picture, you can see the mouth is very, very bad. You know, he's got an oral ca cancer, he cannot eat. So you have to look for an alternative from how to feed the, this uh, patient. So you have to go for a tube feeding, whether it is, it is through the nose, whether it's through the other uh, cervical uh, area, whichever. So here is the subclavian axis and the intergibular axis, which can be given to the patient for proper feeding. And these are the patients admitted in ICU, and they are all on nutritional support. Now, the world of cancer changed in 2005 when Dr. Dean Ornish, which uh, came up with a diet and he developed a lifestyle um, diet um, with 19 cancer inhibiting vitamin minerals and herbs. And he said that it, this diet was effective in halting and reversing the progression of slow growing but potentially fatal prostate cancer. The new four basic food groups that are uh, in his diet are the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, and the legumes. So what he says is even a fast growing cancer can be slowed to the point that the Onish diet will eventually stop them. And he's compared this uh, diet with a three-legged stool in which all the three legs are essential. You 